this? I don't know. It's me. It's Amid the Ruins, this guy who makes dire wave music. <laughs> it's Amid the Ruins. Dire way of music. Wave. music. What I've talked about in, you know, probably a hundred articles of Jay's analysis is the implementation of the AI smart grid and the giant smart cities, which is what IBM talks about publicly building. And that's where we're going and that's what I think we have to be really concerned about. So all of these tensions, they are part of a long-term strategy to basically get everybody moved into mega cities. Uh, they'll be forced to, they'll be forced off of land and so forth for environmental reasons and basically concocted and invented environmental nonsense then you'll be stuck in some hellhole mega city in a, you know, basically a carton-sized apartment living over a Target or something, or inside of a Target or a Walmart, as I said <laughs> several years ago. It's actually coming true now. There's actually Target cities. This is all part of the long-term globalist strategy. So, but to get there, you've got to have the constant clash, the constant um, alchemical blending and mixing and smashing together right out of Manichaeanism to produce the convergence, to produce the synthesis. And that's what's crucial in all this and what is absolutely true from an alchemical, esoteric, philosophical, and geopolitical perspective, the fact the ruling elite seek to be post-human. Jasonalysis.com. can't try to 
fix today's problems politically. And this is what so many people in alt circles and alt right and alt whatever and alt media, they all seem to think that there's like a political solution to man's problems. And really, the, the, the whole of modernity is built on this neo pagan concept of political salvation. And there is no political salvation for man because man's problems are not essentially political, uh, they're spiritual. that actually discussed how to invert and subvert that, changing images of man, things like this. So what has to happen is that, that the, the inversion has to be reverted back to the way it needs to be. And that means that first and foremost for man, it is spiritual issues. Those come first. Then we have the things like the philosophy and, and the family and the social issues and things like that. That comes next. And race or ethnicity can be classed as part of that. That is, in other words, you caring for your people is just a broader extension of the family, the tribe, the nation. Uh, right? It all depends on what we mean by these words and these terms. Now, America and Americanism is the first attempt at a completely propositional nation. And this is well known. This is not debated in political theory. Uh, I think even Abraham Lincoln referred to it that way. Jay Dyer of Jay's Analysis. Dyer 
All right, welcome. We are live on another installment of Q&A. And as we said, we're going to be doing um, Q&A from the audience as well as the Super Chats. You can Super Chat by a stream lab. And we're going to cover this excellent little book that is overlooked. A lot of people overlook this book and they don't think that iconography, you know, they think, well, it's kind of a neat thing that relates to worship. And, you know, uh, Roman Catholics don't really disagree with us over that. And we, we all have that in common. And that's really just a question for Protestants to kind of solve on their own if, if they're looking at orthodoxy. Or maybe it's a problem that Islam has with orthodox iconography or something like that. But that's not actually the case. In fact, everything in this book will argue on the basis of Christology. Right? We're going to see that St. Cyril's Christology. We're going to see that Chalcedon, Diophysitism, is crucial to how it's possible to have iconography and then of course the fifth and sixth councils the christology in relationship to uh, energies is going to be relevant to how we're able to do christology the triad as well right if you don't have a nature person distinction for example we're going to see that it's impossible to do iconography because everyone agrees whether it's the iconoclasts or the iconophiles everyone agrees that you can't image the divine nature the divine usia well, now we're presented with a problem because if we can't image the divine nature and we know that Christ can't be split or divided, what are we, what are we picturing? What are we imaging when we image the Logos, the Son of God incarnate? If it's just his human nature, then we're dividing Christ. So we're going to need the proper theological bag, or not baggage, a toolkit, you could say, uh, uh, the, the proper theological toolkit, philosophical toolkit to allow for the nuances and the distinctions that make iconography possible, of course, without falling into, you know, some Christological error. And the Christological doctrines, as we'll see, as you've heard me say for many, many years, correct Christology is a direct reflection of correct, correct triadology. If you get your triadology messed up, your Christology is going to mess up. And by extension, your worship will mess up because your worship is going to reflect your view of how God relates to the world. Your sacramentology is going to be messed up, right? If you don't have the energies doctrine, there's absolutely no way to have a correct doctrine of the sacraments. And likewise, the ecclesiology, you're not going to have a correct doctrine of the church as the body of Christ because you don't have the possibility of the energies in terms of their imminent presence in the church. Uh, real quick before we get to the chat, now we've got open VC in the Discord. Father Deacon Ananias is joining me. And I put his Twitter into the chat. Be sure and follow him on Twitter. He's wanting to kind of grow that a bit and you can also follow his youtube channel it's also in the show description and then uh we may have other mods in the discord popping on so we're going to be answering questions first uh me and father deacon so any atheists any uh muslims protestants roman catholics uh, it's open forum uh, i'd like to give that open invitation if anybody wants to we will give pre uh, preference to the super chats obviously if you Support the stream via the Streamlabs. You click that link and you can do a super chat via Streamlabs. Uh, we will answer your apologetic questions. One question I'd like to address, which is a, a new thing that the Roman Catholics are relying on to try to play gotcha, is that in the, the Ibarra debate from a couple of years ago, I made the statement that not everything in the ecumenical councils is fallible. Uh, and this is now being spun into, oh, I don't, I deny ecumenical councils. No, no, no. If you go read, uh, if you pick up, say, Price's book or any of the academic books that will treat of the documents out of ecumenical councils, you'll notice that there are tons of documents. There are the minutes of the council. There are the various decrees. There are the canons. There's the dogmatic uh, professions of faith, right? So there's mountains of documents that actually go into and are connected to the ancient ecumenical councils. Many of these documents have not even been translated into English or are still awaiting translation or are in process of translation. That's why the Richard Price books are so expensive if you go to Amazon right now to try to get them. Now, what this, the reason I bring this up is that I was very clear in what sense I said and in what way I said that ecumenical councils... The, the same status is not accorded to everything in the council. So the fact that a canon says this does not mean that it's equally authoritative or equally binding as something in a dogmatic pronouncement or an anathema or something like this or the profession of faith of the council. 
So for example, many canons in the ancient church are no longer applicable. Many canon laws promulgated by ecumenical councils don't relate to now. They relate to cities and jurisdictions that don't even exist in the world. So obviously those, can, those canons are not binding. This is not even that difficult. It's just, a, it's just a pl- attempting to play gotcha as if I meant that entire ecumenical councils can be denied just willy-nilly or something like that. That is not what I said. I was clearly talking about the context of canons, the minutes of councils or which bishops signed on first or this kind of that. These kinds of details are not actually part of the dogma of the council. And I also made the point that contrary to the Roman Catholics, actually this problem is the reverse. It's not actually a thing that I'm promoting or an error that I'm promoting. It's actually a problem that's more applicable to their position because the Roman Catholics believe that the theologians' writings of the councils don't even matter. All that matters is what the Pope approved in this or that council, literally. So they will actually ignore... The Christological presuppositions of this book, which is the which is the basis of the Seventh Council, right, as well as Saint John Damascus's books on the uh, divine images, or they will ignore the theological argumentation of the Cappadocians in terms of Father being the sole cause, source, arche, monarchy in the Trinity, and they'll say, well, it doesn't really matter. Uh, we can still have the filioque because uh, later on we decided that we can have the filioque. So it doesn't matter that the theologians behind the uh, Constantinople one actually preclude the possibility of filioque because we're only bound to the specific sections of the councils that the Pope approves. So actually their position is the one that is more ridiculous, more ahistorical, more absurd, more nonsensical, and without any real factual basis and just completely contrary to what is obviously the case in terms of the theologians of the councils. For example... Could I interpret Ephesus without St. Cyril's theology? Of course not. And I don't think anybody would deny this. This is so patently obvious, right? Could I interpret Nicaea without Athanasius' theology? Of course not. Does that mean that everything in Athanasius or everything in Cyril is infallible? No. Nobody believes that, right? But it's also not the case that in the Roman Catholic perspective, we're just going to, that. well, I'm saying this is their view. Their view is that all that really matters is what the Pope approves in any given council. And then, of course, they themselves are not actually consistent because uh, what is it, the first Lateran or, or, or uh, the Rome, one of the Roman synods, I think the 640s, they, I mean, it's papally approved. There's no reason for them why it's not ecumenical, but it's not ecumenical. So an actual fact, it's their position that is completely arbitrary. And they know good and well that I wasn't saying arbitrarily that you just, I just, I reject ecumenical councils when there's a problem that I don't like. They know that's not what I was arguing. I was specifically talking about Canons, this or that canon. Can't nobody believes canon law is infallible. It's not given de vine. It's given by custom. It's it's the church law. Now yeah, we're not we're not Islamists. Exactly, exactly. Father Deacon, uh, this is a point you always make. I'll let you chime in here because this is why we let bishops interpret the canons, right? When catechumens or people try to take take upon themselves to like interpret canon law, it leads to disastrous consequences because they, there's no nuance there's no understanding of the times that just because something was in canon law doesn't mean that uh it's your job as a catechumen or, or an internet person to try to interpret this and apply it to the church right a weird mix between a pharisaical legalism in which it treats yeah Law is an end in its own right, rather than law as a means to an end. And it's like a a mix and a hybrid with like Kantian, yeah, deontological ethics or something like that. And so that's right. Um, the Muslim and many even Protestants will have this kind of idea too that whatever God reveals is eternal and there's no nuances it right and, and whatsoever and then everything is uh an eternal com- so if god said to you i want you to sustain from uh abstain from eating bread for three days they would think well it comes from god that, that's an eternal statement um that would be one instance of kind of lack of a nuance but the idea with the law is that it, again what does christ say all of the law is summed up 
in this. Mm-hmm. Love, God love neighbors. Neighbor. Yeah, love God with all your heart, mind, soul. Love neighbor as self. So if it goes against that, if applying the the law, the letter goes against what it's actually trying to achieve, then it defeats the whole purpose of law, and that's why God's given the grace and authority to the bishops to understand that kind of context to see that. I think about it this way, I was, I was thinking about this in ethics, that if you have these kind of universal, non-nuanced kind of Kantian, you should always give back property to its rightful owner. And your neighbor, that's the law, let's say, and, and you got to apply that and stick with it, you know, in a wooden, literal fashion every single time. Now, what do you do when your neighbor loans you uh, a gun for hunting you? And then he tells you he's he's been drinking and he's in serious depression, wants to commit suicide. And by the way, he wants his gun back. Well, the law says that you got to give your yeah, that's a good analogy. The, the property back to its rightful owner. So that kind of attitude that you see among people, uh, especially laymen, young inquirers, or catechumens. It's disastrous to apply that kind of. You leave that to the bishops to. Yeah, I mean, imagine, it ima- mean imagine. It's either. Yeah. I mean, when you go go. I mean, I've I've read can I've been reading canon law for many years. I'm not a canon law expert personally. I find canon law very boring. I don't find it that interesting. It's it's you no. Know, there's people who are into that. Good. That's their job. That's not what I'm into. Um, and when you read the, the, law, the, the canons of the councils, you get into canon law, you get into the canons of Sardica, you get into the canons of, uh, of Ephesus, get into the canons of Gangra, of the, uh, the African synods and how they're reaffirmed in Trollo and Seventh Council. I, I know all this stuff, but the point is that those are just church laws most of the time, not all the time. Sometimes they relate to theology and they are relevant to today, but it's not the layperson's job to try to like comb through mountains of canon law yes. to figure out what's applicable to given situations that's what a bishop, i'm not a bishop i don't and i'm not don't want to be i don't have any interest in trying to apply ancient church laws to today but guess what many of them don't apply you can't apply the ancient laws about uh you know not going to the theaters okay that's not talking about going to a movie i've actually had orthodox people get so like pharisaical Let's say uh, you, you're forbidden in the canons to go to any movie. Movies are haram, right? They're like Salafis or something, right? Like, like it, it's, 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 it, that's what the right Muslims say when it's forbidden, right? Yeah. Movies are haram, right? So, uh, again, I'm not saying you should be out watching every degenerate Hollywood movie. That's not the point. The point is that you can't take these ancient canons that dealt with when in the ancient world somebody went to the, the the theater and they had to give obeisance to the pagan gods, that's the context, right? I'm not talking about and and by the way, the same people who do this kind of a move in the orthodox sphere, they end up going off into schism and yeah. they decide that everybody's uh, you know lost grace but them, them and five people, right. five people in a trailer park have, uh, are the only people with grace, so. It's not your duty to try to figure that out if you're Orthodox. And simultaneously, for the Roman Catholics, uh, again, I didn't say that <laughs> ecumenical councils are uh, wrong. It's just that they're not listening to what I'm saying, and they're not. It's I'm being very nuanced and being very clear. There's no ecumenical council that has a dogmatic profession that any person could reject. I constantly tell the fact that the uh, Confession of Saint Cyril, uh, 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 excuse me, Saint Sophronius of Jerusalem. That's a dogmatic uh, confession that's part of the Sixth Council. And it teaches the essence energy distinction. It also teaches uh, creation, right? By the way, you could thing. identify that as a, a straw man fallacy. Uh, yeah, could you illustrate that? Why is that a straw man? So again, if you're actually being nuanced on that, so what was a straw man fallacy? It's when you take your opponent's position, either purposely misrepresented or re- represented in a way that's weaker than it actually is, for the purpose of easily knocking down yeah. the argument, the little straw man. That's actually an informal fallacy. 
Oh, Jay so believes that the Orthodox yeah. believe in ecumenical councils. <laughs> Here's Jay saying not everything in ecumenical council is fall, fall, infallible and they can be wrong. I said canons can be wrong. Yeah. Or they can they can be applied at a point that's no longer applicable. So there, there's a, maybe wrong is not the right word. There's a transience to some canons. Uh, local synods can have uh, canons that are wrong. Sure. But in this one, there, there's canons about subdeacons not marrying. It's also possible that a canon can be right in principle and wrongly applied. Yes. Issue that comes up in and by the way, the Roman Catholics also believe that there are many councils that have erroneous canons. <laughs> they themselves don't accept Canon 28 of Chalcedon. They think it's wrong. So it's well, actually... here goes. That one fits our, our named. Jay and I are coming up with new... New fallacy names. And that one would fall under the one that we came up with. I'm excluded from the critique that I'm applying to you, fallacy. Yeah. I want to apply this critique, but you can't use it on me, fallacy. Exactly, right. So uh, classic. Remember, keep in mind, the very thing they're accusing me of, I'm being nuanced and explaining in what sense canons can be transient, temporal, not relevant for all times and all places which is obviously the case if some of those canons relate to cities and jurisdictions and bishoprics that don't even exist anymore. Meanwhile, they turn around and say that I reject ecumenical councils because I say that it, one of these canons might not be relevant anymore. Uh, and they turn around and reject Canon 28 of Chalcedon. They don't affirm that count that because that canon says that the Bishop of Constantinople is equal in honor and dignity as Rome. And they reject that canon. So, it's well. Notice Jay did the same. The Jay did the same thing with, with me when I was um, not that Su Suan and uh, Christopher Thomas Rosh are really graceful, but like the people that come on in the comments, right? They're always the uh, oh, this deacon doesn't know what he's talking. about. He says yes and no, and right. away yes and away no. Wait a minute, I thought <laughs> those are called distinctions. I thought Thomas and Roman Catholics love distinction. And now I can't do it. Well, it's an Orthodox person. You can't do that. We're allowed to. Right. But you can't do that. Uh, that I'm excluded from the critique I'm applying to you, fallacy. Yeah. And uh, let's talk. And by the way, I also said that individual fathers can err. And everybody believes individual church fathers can get things wrong. So uh, Ibarra, if you remember in that debate, was trying to say, well, then uh, what, if a, what if I find a Western pope that's accepted by you as Orthodox before the schism, and he says something that has a, a strong view of the papacy? Uh, that proves the papacy. No, it doesn't. Uh, because in our system, it's, it's perfectly uh, applicable for somebody to be wrong as an individual church father. And by the way, your system says that. So that, this is the same kind of methodology that I, mean, I find that Roman Catholics and Protestants are very similar in this way that this kind of quote mining, yeah. I'll just find uh, what I want and I'll throw that verse out or that father and then that proves my point. But we don't have an ecclesiology and orthodoxy that's like that. Exactly. We have a consensus and reception. Right. And that's, that's also why I was trying to make an argument about paradigms and presuppositions and data being theory laden and Ibarra never got that point because they don't think that way. Roman Catholics don't think about paradigms and presuppositions. In fact, their whole system is pretty much adopting that classical foundationalist model. So they don't believe in thinking that way. So for them, it's just, let me show you a machine gun spam of uh, 25 Catholic answers proof text for the papacy. There you go. It's like, number one, uh, you're still partly relying on forgeries. By the way, has Eric ever admitted that he was still relying on forgeries in our debate? No, he hasn't. Has he admitted uh, that he's, his initial uh, essays that Ubi showed were uh, rely, uh, relying on forgeries? No, he hasn't. Uh, has he admitted that he changed his position about the uh, tome of Pope Leo being ex cathedra? He took down all of his old posts saying that it was? No, he hasn't admitted that. So there's just this, this constant sort of game playing and, and dishonesty. 
And that's why they're having to resort to gotchas and to, to purposefully ignore the nuances. Anyway, let's move on. Uh, Father Deacon, if you have anything else to say about canon law, feel free. No, that's, that's fine. Okay. Um, welcome, everybody. If you would, please hit like and share. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about the theology of the icon, as well as doing open Q&A. Open Q&A is first. You got me. You got Father Deacon here. Uh, does anybody have any topics that they want to discuss? By the way, we got two big fat super chats from um, a couple days ago. Thanks sent $100. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Uh, and then thank you, Jay, sent another $100 and says, thumbs up, mate. I'm glad to see that your star is rising. Uh-oh. That's occultic. We'll let the we'll let the Illuminate uh, confirm exposers take that comment and clip it and say that I'm Illuminate confirmed. Now, highly edify Astrology, dude. You're doing astrology. Uh, highly edifying in the deep end of truth. All the best, my friend. Well, thank you so much for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, does anybody in the Discord have any topics or issues or discussion that they want to get into? We got we got a room full of people. Does anybody have a? We had somebody earlier said I want to talk. I want to ask a question about Islam. Are you still here, dog? Good crew in here. Yeah, I'm here. What's up, I, dude? I got my question. You forgot your question. Um, no, I said I got my question. I'm just joking. Um, I'm just joking. Uh, um, yeah, I was talking to a friend of mine who's a Muslim, and he brought up. I don't, I'm not in front of my Bible. I think it might be Matthew 24, if I recall correctly. It's um, he's talking about the end end days. No one knows the day or the or the hour. And then he says, only the Father knows, not even the angels. And then there's something that I didn't know that I looked in my OSB, and it, it said that some translations. This, this is what he was saying. Say, not even the Son knows. No one knows. Except for the Father, not even the angels or the Son. Um, and that kind of threw me for a loop a little bit. I hadn't heard that before. Right, this is an ancient Aryan argument. It's been around for forever. Um, Basil covers this in letter 235. Let me make sure this is the right letter. Maybe it's 236. Uh, there's a, I know what it is. There's a, a good essay at the Preacher's Institute uh, on this. I'm going to put it, I'm typing it because I want to put it in the chat for the. It's not saying that, that Christ lacked knowledge because. Christ is a divine subject, divine person. So he's not lacking knowledge, but he can speak by appropriation is the word that St. John Damascus will use. Uh, hold on a second. Yeah, I was trying to tell him about Christ doing and saying things proper to his human nature. Mm -hmm. um, and I was I, I was really trying, but um, it's like they... they well, they're only they interested in to, they're only interested in certain texts, right? So they they're not yeah, going to look at all yeah. the texts, right? Um, I gotta find the exact title. They don't want to like even understand the concept of like a distinction between nature and person, or how. A person, we can show it having two two natures and acting and speaking proper to one of the natures. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's like a brick wall, dude. <laughs> right. So it's similar to like when we call Christ uh, a curse, and like Protestants think, oh, that means he like literally became cursed, and the and the Father hated him. It's uh, as if he were cursed. Right. He is treated as one cursed. It does not mean that he is literally cursed. Or um, if you read uh, it, it's if you read John Damascus book three, it's the sections 28, 29, 30, I think. It's the last three chapters in book three 
where he, he describes appropriation. And so it's the son saying, it's as if, right? Like it's, it's an as if statement, right? Or a for our sake statement. It's a, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, it's like an exaggeration where I say like, Hyperbole. like no man even know, not even any man knows this, right? Not even the hyperbolic, son of hyperbolic, right? Is yeah, hyperbole. Right? Yeah, that's what I'm looking for, right? Yeah, and he does that a lot, like uh, call no man father. Well, um, cut, cut your hand off if it makes you sin. I mean, <laughs> right, right. Come on, that's a hyperbole. But they don't want to like. Well, uh, they, they, they won't allow nuance when we interpret things, but when it comes to the Quran, oh, you better give me nuance with all these problems in the Quran, right? But, By the uh, way, I did enjoy yeah. that tweet. I forget who sent it out. Protestant says, call no man father as they sing Father Abraham in Sunday school. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> uh, let me... It's, I know it's Basil has a whole letter on this. It's right here. Maybe it's 39 after 38 on Nature in Person. Basil has a really good letter on this, but I'm just trying to find it. No, that's about war. That's not it. 236. Let me grab my copy of it because I know where it's marked in there. with Muslims it's like it feels like talking to a little kid like you have to slow down <laughs> and like talk loud it's kind of funny <laughs> It's right after the, where he talks about 230, letters 234, I think. Here we go. Yeah, here it is. It's 236. So here's Basil's letter 236 on the ignorance of the sun. It's a, yeah, here it is. And I'm going to put it in the chat for everybody. So, And the Preacher's Institute uh, article just cite. It just restates uh, Basil on letter 236. So, uh, so he says... Because the Arians were, were always using this as one of their key arguments. No man seems to be a general expression that um, not a single person is accepted by it. But this is not its use in scripture, as I observed in many passages. There's none good but God, right? Jesus says that. Does that mean that Jesus isn't good? Only God the Father? For even in this passage, the Son does not speak to the exclusion of himself from being good. Because in other places, he calls himself good. Since the Father is the first good, we believe the words no man have been uttered with uh, understanding the addition of the first. So with this passage, no man knows the Son but the... Can somebody stop? That's really loud. Scraping. Um, no man knows the, so the, father, the Son but the Father, Matthew eleven twenty seven. 27. So there is the charge of ignorance against the Spirit. But only so in other words, if we say no one knows the son, but the father, does that mean that the Holy Spirit doesn't know the father? So these are, as Father Deacon said, hyperbole. Even here, there is not a statement of the ignorance of the Holy Spirit, but a testament to the knowledge of his own nature that naturally belongs to the father first. Thus, we also understand in Matthew 24, 36, that no man knows to refer to the father as the first knowledge of things, both present and to be generally and to exhibit to men as the first cause. So in other words, it's just like when Jesus is saying no man's good but the father, right? No man's good but God, right? 
uh, it's not to the exclusion of himself, but it's to give the, the deference to the father as the sole cause, RK, and principle, right? Does that make sense? Does make sense. Uh, it's, it's one of those things where kind of gauge some of the Muslims, and then you're like, right. are they going to be able to even process? It's just kind of sucks, you know what I mean? Well, unfortunately, uh, no, because they again are not big fans of nuance so and i'm not meaning to be mean but i mean we've had many interactions with uh, muslims and they're not that interested in nuance and a lot of the apologetic from islam is just based on these kind of like word concept fallacies very uh you know simplistic uh either or fallacies etc Yeah, thanks, Shay. You said 236, Basil? Yeah, I put it in the link uh, in for the uh, people in the Discord. And that's also... Yeah, just letter 236. It's a good good letter. I wish I could find that uh, essay at Preacher's Institute that talks about it. It's really good. Here it is. All right, thanks, Shay. Here it is. I found it. I will put this also in the chat for everybody. Uh, who's this by? Father somebody. Uh, oh, you, didn't say you know Father somebody too? It, did, it doesn't say who wrote it. It's just, it just has a, it just, just posted here. I don't know. Um, We're going to Father somebody's parish on Sunday. <laughs> Um, I will share this in the VC general in the discord. So give me just a minute and I'll share it there. But yeah, that's the, the point is that it's linguistic and, um, he cites letter 236 of Basil, uh, and he points out there's none good, but God, no man knows the son of the father, etc. My father only, right. Um, does that mean when Jesus says my uh, father only uh, that it excludes the Holy Spirit or all these those are reductios right so if, if that was the case all these statements would also be interpreted in that way and would reduce to absurdity which are all really good arguments right um, anyway so there's that and there's the two sources that are good on that and by the way you can follow Father Deacon there he's in the chat uh, you missed it. There's this letter 236 of Basil, and then this uh, article at Preachers Institute is really good on that. All right. Uh, Nevin says for $5, what is the difference between natural law, <laughs> insert Mark Pazio's voice, natural law, and the uh, Kybalion Hermetic principles? How does one differ or relate to what Jesus taught? The easiest way I can answer this is to say that. For any system, whether it's Mark Passio and his kind of esoteric alchemical natural law, or whether it's Enlightenment philosophers, or whether it's Thomists, Thomas Aquinas and natural law, the easiest way I could classify the difference is that for all those guys, this really has nothing to do with the second person of the Godhead. There's no direct connection between the laws of nature per se, what those laws are, and the Logos, a.k.a. the second person of the Trinity, and his imminent presence in the world. For the Orthodox, the laws of nature are Logi, right? They're the principles that God has established ultimately, right? I mean, it's principles and laws for the created order, but they're patterned on the ordering of the Logos himself, okay? So that's the big difference is that nobody from those schools of the Enlightenment or even the, the Thomists would say that nature and its laws has any direct re relationship to Jesus, per se. Uh, I think that down the road, yeah, a, a Thomist or a, a Roman Catholic would say, well, maybe down the road, yes, I can kind of link this to Jesus and the Trinity. But uh, when we're doing natural law, we're just, we're just doing autonomous reasoning. We're saying there's no autonomous reasoning. It's not possible. You can't do autonomous reasoning in a coherent way. You can do it physically, right? Noetically, you can do it. But whether you can give an account for it and justify it is a different thing. And that's what we're saying you can't do. And that's why Justin Popovich, St. Justin Popovich, 
wrote a whole essay saying that we don't believe in natural law. And he's talking about in the sense of Thomism, Western philosophy, and how the Western ethos of natural law, that's the wrong book. The Western ethos of natural law leads to atheism. It leads to deism. That's one. Father Deacon, would you comment on, uh, what would you say to somebody who said, uh, what's wrong with just going by natural law according to, you know, like enlightenment philosophers or something? Well, yeah, you see a series of departures. And again, this is kind of word concept fallacy, just because we're using the same word doesn't mean that throughout the kind of various ages and philosophies, that means the same sort of thing. The departure from orthodoxy, remember, is always personalized. Yeah. And so there isn't this, oh, there's the transcendent God out there and the, even the Holy Trinity and stuff like that. And then there's God's created order. And then we just from our own minds and this created order um, reason up and find kind of God's thumbprint. That's kind of the way it is, right? It's like the 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 after effect of God left is is almost kind of a, what I would say a scholastic kind of notion that yeah, it's a good way to put of it. natural law. It reflects, yeah. but that's not personalized, right? That God is actually both transcendent and imminent within creation, and so the way that that's why we don't have natural theology the way that the Roman Catholics in the West would. Um, we have natural revelation and supernatural revelation, and they're not, they're all understood as you put, rightly pointed out. It was really well that you said it that way. Um, personalized, understood in terms of the, specifically the second person of the Holy Jesus. Trinity. Yes. <laughs> right. Now, after you get, after the kind of uh, Thomistics and the scholasticism, the Enlightenment because of modernity that mechanizes nature. So at least with the, with the Thomas and scholastics, their natural law was things have natures and essences right. in the material world. Right. And that obviously comes from God is grounded in God. So there, there is some sort of connection there, but once the, the modern philosophers mechanize nature and abolish essences and forms in nature, they just keep natural law by name. In fact, what you'll start to see in the Enlightenment thinkers is natural law is the law of reason. Because nature, there's nothing to be found in nature. It's just a, a machine, right? So rather than looking to nature, you look to everything's anthropocentric uh, uh, concerns now. And man's elevated higher than uh, all of nature not within nature and really almost higher than God. So man's law of reason becomes natural law. You, you find this in all the like Rousseau, uh, Kant, Hobbes, mm -hmm. they all talk about this, the right. natural law, the law of reason, right? Yeah. Well, what's the law of reason? Well, whatever I say it is, right? It's always, <laughs> and then eventually that's just kind of abolished altogether. It just, right. But, you know, even the Founding Fathers talk about, like, um, natural law, their enlightenment natural law thinking. There's nothing in actually nature. It, it has to do with kind of law-like uh, structures within the mind right? that are supposed to be universally applicable to all. Yeah. But again, once you get, get the critics uh, of the enlightenment, then that just falls apart as well so yeah it really has nothing to do with the kind of orthodox concept at all but anyways i hope i didn't no that's a great answer yeah explain. uh we got more super chats but uh does anybody in the discord have a question open forum <laughs> say what i do can you hear me yeah go ahead um I've been thinking about the fate of the Byzantine Empire and Middle Eastern Christendom lately. Eastern Orthodoxy and other Christian denominations have been in the decline from the advances of the 
Arab Caliphate and Ottomans to the high rates of out-migration, persecution, and low birth rates among Middle Eastern Christians today. Mm-hmm. Christianity and Orthodoxy are favored by God. Why has this happened? Well, if you read Apocalypse 2 and 3, um, Jesus says that you will be persecuted, and if you are faithful to me, I will bless you, but if you're not faithful, I will bring chastisement. So we don't always know the reasons as to why this or that uh, church perishes or doesn't exist anymore. But Jesus does warn that uh, actual historical churches will have their lampstands removed. And in fact, if you look at the seven churches of Asia Minor in Apocalypse 2 and 3, some of those don't exist anymore. They're not around. They've had their lampstand removed. Now, I'm not going to sit here and try to look, look back in history and say, ah, oh, this was the point where they were judged and Jesus removed their lampstand at this point in you know 150 AD. I, I don't know that. But we have the principle laid down in Apocalypse 2 and 3 that covenant blessings and covenant cursings do continue on in terms of the life of the church. And by the way, Jesus said you would be persecuted. So persecution and the the numbers is not what determines orthodoxy. In fact, in one point in the Roman Empire, the majority of the empire was heterodox. So it's, it's not a matter of uh, Catholicity is not primarily concerned with numbers. Hey. I have another question, if you don't mind. Sure. What do you think of the prophecies of St. Paisios related to the future war between Russia and Turkey? Do you see the prophecy as inspired by God, and do you see any hint of it being fulfilled? Uh, I would not say that any individual saint uh, has the ability to prophesy with the authority of God, per se. I think that the Holy Spirit can give saints clairvoyance, and they can understand events ahead of time. But that is not the same as divine revelation. And also, I don't know to what degree all of the different so-called claims of St. Paisios are his. So I'm not saying yeah. that. I'm not saying and not. whether he was actually intending to speak himself prophetically about, um, they could be easily taken out of context. And again, uh, Speck and I were talking about this, that prophecy isn't... So much intended to predict the future is to kind of confirm um, and be understood once it's happening is kind of yeah. I, I mean, I mean, it's entirely possible that uh, he predicted things about a coming war. I, I don't have any any. I'm not saying that it isn't true. Um, I've talked to uh, people that I respect who believe that all of those statements are true. I've talked to people that I respect that say that some people have claimed that there's prophecies of his that are not actually his. So I don't have any view on that, but I actually I actually shared months ago his statement on the stabbies from his uh, uh-huh. book from many years ago. So uh, that one is definitely uh, valid. Do you remember Father Sarah from Rose's lecture about the end times? Uh, he had a really good point about, you know, you're not to get too specific on the details. No man knows the hour, the day or hour, but that we're to have nets, we're to be watchful. So I think it's good to listen to these things. They're not dogmatic. Again, we don't exactly know. But there are signs of the times coming. Um, and I think it's good to be on guard and, and watchful. So you could use right. those and be like, maybe that's true. Maybe I should be careful about... I think that's probably a healthy approach. Yeah, I mean, there were Greek uh, peasant people who thought that barcodes on products were the mark of the beast in the end time yeah. you know, and that's just you don't want to get caught up in over obsessing on that stuff but obviously yeah there will be some form of a you know tracking controlling thing whether this is it i don't know but there will be we don't want to become hal Lindsay's. <laughs> yep. those are the only questions i had okay thank you, thank you. great sure. great questions yeah good questions anybody else it's open forum um, can i yeah. just quickly jump in and ask a question Sure. Um, just on the question of holy tradition, um, and I know this is going to sound pretty typical coming from a Protestant. Um, how can we justify, say, some of the more some of the more minor tangents on holy tradition, uh, such as the specifics, which I can't really find any historical justification for? Like what? So, for example, um, and this again is going to come from a prop viewpoint, um, the Dormition of the Theotokos, for example. Um, and other, just to name a specific,
specific. I'm not uh, asking about that one uh, specifically, just a general question on the validity of holy tradition. Right. So we would say that all of the uh, truths of dogma are handed down from the apostles to their successors. And it's easy to demonstrate that not all of that is purely written. In fact, the church itself is who determined the canon of scripture. Uh, that's easy, easily verified, right? And there are many things, in fact, that are not in the written deposit that were believed from the earliest times. But the fact that we don't have a specific reference to something in the first century does not necessarily mean that it was not believed. That's an argument from silence. So, in other words, I would say to you, on what basis do you know that there must be a specific reference to each type of thing that's believed to make it part of the deposit of faith? How do you know that that's the case? And by the way, whatever you answer, you're not going to be able to be consistent with it because you don't even believe that because you don't have a canon of scripture in the second, third or fourth century that's consistent and coherent and believed. Okay. Um, yeah, interesting answer. Um, I would just go on to say um, a lot of the interpretations, again, also come from tradition. Um, yeah. So, for example, the was between the Old Testament and the New Testament, um, which, again, I, some of them I see, some of them I think are a little bit of a long bow to draw, so to speak. Oh, hold on, um, hold on, hold on. Uh, give an example of what you're talking about. You, you lost me there. Old Testament, New Testament. What are you, what are you talking about? Well, the archetypes between the Old Testament and the New Testament, kind of a mirror, mirroring, for example, um, of some of the st some of the stuff written in uh, the Laws and the Prophets, and some of the stuff which uh, would later come to pass. Oh, hold on, in terms of Mary, or what are you talking about? No, I'm just talking about in general. What 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 is a what is a stretch? Are are you coming from a position of saying that you don't think there's continuity between the Old and the New Testament? No, no, I think there's continuity between the Old and the New Testament. But for example, some of the more some of the more weird interpretations I've heard come out, such as uh, that between Adam uh, and his sleep, uh, comparing that between Christ and his resurrection, uh, his resurrection, um, and specific doctrines surrounding that. That's just a specific example. Oh, so you're saying that sometimes typology is uh, uh, a stretch. Uh, yeah, I don't have a problem saying that sometimes the church fathers engage in um, typological interpretations that uh, could be reaching. Uh, sure. Okay. But that does not prove that typology is uh, an invalid hermeneutical approach. It's the apostles themselves that engage in, typolo engage in typological hermeneutics consistently. Hello? Yep. Yeah, I think that just about answers it. Sorry, I uh, framed that in a horrible way. I'll try and frame it better next time. Okay, no problem. By the way, I'd argue too, it's very easy um, to see when there's traditions that are innovated. Because in the history, there's always a response to innovations. Therefore, because the principle is what's received, or kind of the St. Vincent, mm -hmm. Vincentian canon, quote, way, quote, semper, quote, ab, omnibus, credit, sum est, what has been believed everywhere, always by all. Um, that's that kind of rule, the canon that because we believe these these traditions are handed down, when we find something that hasn't been believed everywhere, mm -hmm. or always, or by all, um, it becomes immediately evident. And we have the fathers and the church respond to that. So as far as like the Dormition, um, we have some pretty, I have a great, book um on um, uh, it's it's the life of the virgin mary and it's the largest collection of all the historical writings from scripture to uh you know fathers and traditions compiled about that and uh goes back pretty early as far as the dormition but just again as jay had said 
simply because let's say you found something written the first time it was written was uh, or recorded about something in the fourth century doesn't mean that it wasn't believed in practice. Yeah, it's an argument from silence. Everywhere prior to that. That's like yeah. saying I'm not going to accept. I'm not. That's like saying. That's like saying I'm not going to accept the canon of the scriptures unless I see the Protestant or the Orthodox canon listed specifically in the first and second centuries. Well, guess what? Nobody has that, <laughs> so you're not going to find it. Yes, but um, yeah. but in the case, oh, sorry. Go ahead. You wanna... Go ahead. Okay. In the case of the Dormition, uh, the Dormition, for example, um, the I think earliest example we can find of it is actually in a condemned work, the Proto Evangelicum of James. I think it was condemned twice, once in five twenty, another time later on. That might have just been in the West. Uh, a whole condemned where? What are you talking about? I thought it was the text, not the belief, but the text, the Proto-Evangelical Hold on. James, if it, so people. not being canonical does not mean it's condemned, okay? the Jew, Enoch is not canonical. It doesn't mean it's condemned. Fair point. It's, it means it's not, it's not scripture, but it doesn't mean it's false. Because then, I mean, think about it. We would actually have to be, like, condemn all of history. It's not because it's, it's not in scripture. Not <laughs> right. Yeah, but it's like we use history. That's how we know and kind of verify things in the church too. It's just when we when we say it's not in the canon, we mean it's 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 not the level of, of scripture. It's not about the same thing. Um, it, it doesn't, but it doesn't mean that it's false. And again, that again, so if, trustworthy. Right, right. But so let's let yeah. but let's remember the Protestants. Uh, presupposition here, which is that the ultimate ground of authority for the believer that's infallible is the written text of scripture. And so, but he's also got this standard that I'm only going to accept as something consistent with apostolic revelation that I find explicitly mentioned earlier than said century. But again, the th very thing that you appeal to scripture does not have the correct canon listed prior to said century. So your own uh, your own requirement undercuts your own system starting point. That is that's all that's needed to, to show that that's not a good argument. Fair. Um, just getting back on the proto the proto evangelicum of James because yeah. again we seem to be on that tangent. Um, I've got the specific dates here. It was condemned by Pope the text. Condemned by Pope Innocent uh, I in 504, and again by the Galatian Decree around 500, despite, you know, of course, being influential uh, for this doctrine. Condemned? Uh, we're asking that question. It was not received as yeah. canonical. But yeah, and rejected later on. Yeah, rejected from the canon. Yeah, condemned and rejected from the canon are two separate Those things. Those decrees that you're talking about are uh, when the West was trying to determine the canon. That's what you're talking about. It nope. doesn't mean that it's false. It means it's not part of scripture. Yeah. The, Rich, the, that's why it's not. The, the book of condemned. Enoch. The book of Enoch. Rejected. The book of Enoch yeah. con contains true tradition. It is not canon. It's cited by Jude. Well, yes, but to get on your point, Paul also cites the Cretan poets at one point. Um, I believe, although. I yeah, no, that proves uh, my point because Paul has no problem finding point, truth yeah. outside of the canon of Scripture. Exactly. And just because Paul cites a pagan poet doesn't mean that everything that's extra canonical is of the same uh, status. No, but of course, how do we know to take what's legitimate out of extra canonical books uh, and what isn't legitimate out of because extra canonical Christ books? established a historic normative body of authoritative rulers in the church, the bishops. And I, that, okay. I, actually argue, I actually argue that books can't be authoritative. So God, on uh, the Protestant model, God gives you, the book is the ultimate authority. Books aren't, authority implies a body, right? Yeah. The book can be only authoritative in as much as there's a normative body. Yeah. Who That's enforces the book? <laughs> who enforces the book? Yeah, who enforces the book? And also, who settles disputes um, and miss it when you have disputing uh, interpretations? 
The book. This is why <laughs> the book. we can talk about the constitution of a country being authoritative only insofar as there is a body that's a normative authority that's able to settle disputes on a constitution. Right. So it doesn't even make sense, even on a Protestant model, to say the book is the highest authority. Books are not authorities. You, you need a living body of people that are given a normative power that can actually bind it and uh, tell you that their interpretation of that book would actually be binding. Yep. So the, and, the Protestant system uh, doesn't even make sense. And uh, Lewis just did a video where he outlines the authority that the church has in terms of worship, right? So uh, Protestants right, lacking any kind of coherent way to know the proper way to worship God. Uh, if you look at the video on Orthodox Shahada, uh, it also shows how the church has the ability to bind and to to make decisions about worship. Uh, and so that's why we weren't left with a do-it-yourself uh, approach to, to how we worship God. We were actually given a pattern of sound doctrine, a pattern of liturgical worship in the church. Lewis's video is excellent. I highly recommend, if you've not seen his video, Christian Worship and the Old Testament, he proves that the patterns and principles of Old Testament temple and synagogue worship carry over into the church such that the church can create and celebrate her victories, right? So in other words, is it true? Is it true that in the, is there a, is there a Sunday of orthodoxy in the first century? No, but that's because the Sunday of orthodoxy is celebrating a victory that happened centuries later in 787, which we're going to be covering here in a minute with this book. Right. And that's because the church has the authority, just like the synagogue had the authority and the power to institute services, Purim, celebrating what happens in the book of Esther, Hanukkah. Right. Why would the church have any less power to institute her feasts and her uh, solemn ceremonies and liturgical celebrations? Well, she doesn't. She has all that power and authority because she has a succession just as much and more so than the Old Testament. Israel had a succession. And the Protestants don't have that succession. But Jay, I'd also add, it's not like there's the authoritative body looking back 600, 700 years going, uh, well, look at this old dusty text that we found. Like, um, it isn't canon, but we could use, remember, as far as the proto-evangelism of James, those in the time were able to actually say that these things in that text are true because there was a living practice tradition of these things about Mary. Yeah, I mean, really, right? all, so if every... you wanted to know the standard, it's not just like we're looking back in the past asking yeah. the question, well, what books do I know are reliable that are outside of Scripture? You've got it backwards. It's those who were in the time... That, and, and many of the te there were additional texts too that are lost that they're actually able those fathers in the time say that uh, we know that so and so said this we know that they did this um, and they'll refer to those texts and they refer to the living practice traditions of those believers who believe that every at all times and and so that's actually the criteria. So it's in conjunction with that. There's a con uh, continuity and consistency within history, within the practice, within the beliefs, within the recorded text of those who are present in time in conjunction with the authority of the church that makes the point. All right, thanks. Um, yeah, thanks. Thank you. Uh, if somebody would, in the VC general in the Discord, uh, put Lewis's link uh, in there for him for uh, the Christian worship in the Old Testament because it's it's a must see. Um, see, so we got a couple super chats here. Let's see. Uh, here's a good one. So, uh, Z uh, Nevin for five dollars. What is the difference between? No, wait, wrong guy. Xander the Great, three dollars. Hey, Jay and Father De Deacon, uh, thank you for your work. How does God have one mind and yet be three persons? So for Orthodox theology, uh, in our metaphysic, you could say mind is a property or faculty or constituent component of nature, not a person. This is confusing to a lot of people in the modern West or in the modern world because they think of 
mind or soul as person, right? Um, that's not our, our conception of this. In fact, even amongst human beings, we share a common principle or power or faculty of mind, right? So I know that sounds a little weird because you think, well, my mind's not your mind. Correct. That's where we get into the question of mode, right? So mode is relevant for the Trinity because, because even though we're saying that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have the same principle of mind or faculty or attribute or power of mind it doesn't mean they each have the identical mind in the same way so the father uniquely instantiates or in hypostatizes mind in his own way the son uniquely instantiates or in hypostatizes mind in his own way and the spirit does the same just like between you and i we both have considered in itself mind that's the same mind mind as mind mind qua mind is the same but my mind is not your mind so how is it different because i uniquely instantiate mind as the mind of j yeah. Yeah. yeah in the mode of person this is why person and nature are so crucial to orthodox trinitarian theology and that's why we will say for example in the trinity the trinity has one nature one mind one will right one essence Human beings, right? Considered as hu in, in terms of human nature itself, all human beings possess one universal human nature of body, mind, soul, will. Does that mean that everybody has the identical body, mind, soul, and will in one sense? Yes, in that it's all one. It's all one type of human nature that we all consubstantially share. Yet, it's also uniquely instantiated and particularized or individuated on the basis of the person that has that nature. So I'm the person J, and I uniquely instantiate human nature in the way that I have it. You're the person Bob, you uniquely instantiate and have human nature in the way that you have it, right? According to the idiomata or the characteristics that make up you, right? This man is snub-nosed. That man has long legs this man is eight feet tall right this man is four feet tall right those are the idiomata or particular characteristics that pick out that person but the person is not the idiomata or characteristics the person is the inner core or subject that has that nature so uh, that's how and why we say that the trinity is not three person uh, th excuse me three minds it's one possesses a single mind uniquely instantiated in three hypostases. And the analogy of the Cappadocians is to humans. Human nature is uniquely instantiated in the mode of each individual hypostasis. Me, you, whoever. Uh, so uh, I know that might be a little confusing, but hopefully that makes sense. That's why we don't say God has three wills. Because will is not a property of person. It's a property or faculty of nature. This is why Christ has two wills for us, because he possesses a human nature and a divine nature. But the person that possesses those natures is the Logos, the second person of the Godhead from all eternity. Father Deacon, anything you want to add to that? Oh, that's perfect. Well said. So this is why we have to understand person, nature, will, energy, and mode, tropos, right, to have the right triadology and the right Christology. That's why we always harp on this in terms of orthodoxy. Um, mean Joe Hicks for $10. What is the difference in the way that we under, excuse me, the, understand the Old Testament versus the New Testament? Uh, is it related to the incarnation and theosis? Uh, in, the incarnation and theosis and Pentecost do uh, play a key role in telling us the difference, right? So in one sense, there's continuity, right? There's continuity in the sense that, for example, we're not saved in a different way, right? It's not some evangelicals, for example, they'll think, oh, in the Old Testament, you're saved by works. Uh, now you're saved by uh, purely gracious beneficence on the part of God. No, you could never be saved by works. Okay. Paul makes this point about Abraham. Was Abraham saved by his human efforts and work or his biology or his, uh, you know, racial lineage? No. So salvation has never been by works. In fact, St. Maximus even says that the Old Testament saints noetically perceive God via their news. So when they see the Theophanies, he says that's that's a noetic person. There's no other way to have known and perceived and had a relationship with God than via the noetic faculty. 
So even in the Old Testament, the saints perceived God directly by the noetic faculty or even sometimes by their eyes. St. Gregory Palma says that they even saw God in terms of theophany, sometimes physically. And, that, and God can do that, right? There's nothing that restricts God from being able to do that. Unless you're a Roman Catholic and you believe that, that it's holograms manifesting or something like that. But for our theology, no, there's nothing that restricts God from doing that. So I would say that, but typically when people think about this, they're thinking about the ceremonial laws, right? And this is what Paul is arguing in a lot of his, especially Romans and Galatians, right? Where he's trying to give an account for how Abraham is a great figure because we all know that Abraham was a friend of God and was righteous prior to the giving of circumcision. So therefore circumcision, just like with Noah, right? Can't be a requirement if God accepted Noah or Abraham before circumcision, you see. So circumcision is not inherent to being righteous with God, even though God did require it after he gave it. And it would have been a sin in the case of, right? Remember when Moses uh, is lax about having his son circumcised and Zipporah fusses at him and says, you're a, a, a father of blood to me or whatever. He says a, a man of blood or something like that. And she's mad at him over that, right? Because he's being negligent. It's one of the, one of the instances where Moses sins, just like when he loses his temper and he throws the 10 commandments down, right? He, made some mistakes the saints make mistakes they're not perfect anyway point being is that uh, uh so in the sense of uh, how we're saved in the sense of what is being believed the old testament saints did not find salvation through quote judaism they did not find salvation through works or through generic theism they believed according to the new testament in the messiah to come there's, there's literally no other way to be saved than through christ Abraham, Paul says, looked to the day of the Savior, looked ahead to Christ. Jesus says, Abraham looked for my day and he saw it and was glad. All right. Hebrews 12, 11 and 12, right? The gospel was preached beforehand to Abraham, right? They believed the gospel in the Old Testament or they didn't believe it, right? But now it's different in the sense that for us, right, we live after the coming of the Messiah. And the, the key event that's usually forgotten, everybody knows that, right, prior to the death, and resurrection, but everybody forgets Pentecost. Pentecost is the empowering of the church to go forth, right, with that new degree of power that was not present in the Old Testament. So does that mean that God wasn't present and omnipresent in the Old Testament or that the Holy Spirit wasn't around in the Old Testament? No. But it's a new way of being present in the church, right? It's a new mode of being in the church that was not prior present due to now after the incarnation, human nature has been sanctified, right? And that's why Jesus says, if I don't go away, the helper won't come. So it's a matter of degree, emphasis, and power that distinguishes the New Testament from the Old Testament. There's nothing inherently missing that they didn't have right like oh they didn't have the holy spirit in the old testament no there's many t passages that tell you that they had the holy spirit oh they didn't have a theosis in the old testament yes they did Saint Maximus says wow. it. but they didn't have the degree and the power and the focus that we have and that's why even after the coming of christ right is everything totally quote spiritual now no right you can still get physically sick as a punishment or a chastisement after the resurrection of christ Again, what does Jesus say in Apocalypse 2 and 3 to this about the seven churches? He says, there's a false teacher at one of these churches, and uh, I'm going to throw her into a sick bed to give her a chance to repent. And if she doesn't repent, that church is going to lose the lampstand or they'll be, you know, destroyed. So there's even still in the New Testament, there's still physical chastisements. There's still physical blessings. I mean, who would be so absurd as to think that if you're wealthy or if you have a gift in the New Testament, is that not from God or from God's providence? No, of course it is. That's why St. John Chrysostom says that you have a duty to help other people if you are wealthy. Because God gave you the wealth, he says, to help others. So blessings, chastisements, cursings, even still after the resurrection, after Pentecost, do apply in the post, right, in the, the times of the Gentiles, in the, in the church era, you could say. But even still, we're all still one city and one heavenly Jerusalem, according to uh, Hebrews 11 and 12. Father Deacon, was there anything you would add? No, that's great. Yeah. I was gonna Can I piggyback you back a question on that? Sure. Jay, Jay just talk, says everything better than I do, so I'm just going to let you talk, Jay. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, 
So, um, in regards to iconography, you know, you said um, a lot of these uh, were perceived noetically. So, would that be why in, say, Old Testament iconography, I think in Chronicles or the Book of Solomon, they talk about this depiction of angels and cherubim and whatnot, that it's all uh, depictions of noetic beings? Is that kind of related to that in the iconography? Well, I'm not saying that uh, the Old Testament saints didn't see God directly. Right. I, I'm not, I wasn't talking about iconography. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I wasn't talking about iconography per se in the old Testament, but, um, I mean, because angels could, can manifest physically too. Right? I mean, they can, they can manifest. That's why Hebrews says that, uh, you can entertain angels unaware. But I, I don't, I'm not sure I would make a, a direct connection per se between, the fact that the Old Testament temple has angels to um, only perceiving uh, noetic beings. Uh, I, I don't know about that. I mean, the Old Testament temple had other things that are not noetic in it. Like it had, it had Edenic imagery. It had trees. It had pomegranates. It's got all kinds of symbolism there. Um, it's not all necessarily noetic. Anybody else have any questions? So, um, yeah, yeah, I, I've got a quick question. Go um, so, what exactly do you mean when you say um, that, like, public uh, divine revelation is closed, and how do we know that? That was the heresy of Montan or something. If you want to take that up, Jay. Sure. There's already uh, uh, early church uh, heretics that claim to continue uh, public divine revelation. Um, when the when John the Apostle died, there's no more public revelation. There's no more new revelations. Uh, anything that the apostles taught in writing or orally was authoritative, was normative, and was divine revelation. Right. And when and when John died, Saint John the Apostle, he's the last one. When he died, that's it. No more public revelation. Because from that point on, it's the passing on of the deposit, the deposit of the apostolic faith. right? And so we even have in, Ze is it, uh, in Zechariah the statement that when the Messiah comes, speaking of the Messianic age, if any man attempts to prophesy, they will stone him with a stone because they will say, you speak lies. Because there won't be public revelation and prophecy anymore. Jesus said the law and the prophets were until John the Baptist. No more prophetic office like the Old Testament prophets. So uh, in the New Testament, yes, there's the office of prophet or teacher. When Pentecost comes and sends in, uh, the, the, the church out and establishes the church, but that doesn't mean there's new revelations. And in fact, at the end of the apocalypse, there's a curse for adding new revelation. So one way we know is that Apocalypse 22 curses anyone that has new revelation. And that's in that's consistent with what's in Zechariah about not prophesying anymore in the, the Messianic period. That doesn't mean that an individual saint like St. Paisios or many of these other saints, that they can't have clairvoyance or know uh, that the elders can't know things about you in a supernatural way. Uh, but that's not equated to public revelation. We don't, we're not Roman Catholic. There's no Fatima that's going to give us like a new uh, uh, way to, you know, like the, like the trads do, where they don't care what, but they don't care what the Pope says. They just follow apparitions. Are you there? Yep, that that uh, that makes sense. Thank you. Sure, I'm looking for the text in Zechariah that talks about uh, uh, no longer prophesying because it came up in Discord the other day. Can somebody mute instead of typing on the computer? Uh, let's see.
Jay, quick question here. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so, dealing with people who are Judaizing and um, taking it a step further of Sabbatarianism, but rather um, saying, you know, that we need to keep the Old Testament holy days, right? Um, a common criticism I've, I've had in um, my apologetics to some of these people is I point to, you know, the continuation of these holy days and the fulfillment of them and, you know, Pascha and Pentecost, but, right. you know, the, 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 the third major um, festive season right in the fall, the fall festivals of, um, like, the Feast of Trumpets, the Feast of Atonement, and uh, Feast of Tabernacles. What, what, what comes to mind as the best um, New Testament or church fulfillment of those days? Well, atonement is what Christ did when he ascended and sat at the right hand of the Father. I mean, the New Testament, Paul, was it Romans 3 or 4, talks about Christ uh, cleansing the mercy seat when he ascended to the heavenly tabernacle. So Hebrews will tell you uh, what atonement is in terms of the new reality. It's when Christ ascended, right? Is it Hebrews 7, where Christ, like the high priest, goes in on the day of atonement? Paul says Christ's ascension is the fulfillment of that. Do you, know, do you know what I'm talking about in Hebrews? Hebrews yeah, 7? yeah, yeah. Right, right, right. Uh, and what I'm, was, the, what was the other one you listed? You said uh, uh, Coleman and what? Like, uh, well, I guess mainly like the Feast of Tabernacles, right? That was like the third major pil- like feast where there was pilgrimage to the temple. You know, um, we have a very distinct Paschal season. We have a very distinct Pentecost season. Um, what, what, I mean, because... Yeah, but idea, isn't, right? isn't Feast of Booths directly related to uh, in gathering Feast of Ingathering? Yeah, right, right, right. And we do have the you know indwelling of the Holy Spirit and and um, all these things. But well, I don't know. I've heard I've heard it be say that we point to like the Feast of the Transfiguration as a as a fulfillment of these things. But um, yeah, just wondering what you had to think on that. Uh, if you read Edersheim's book, I looked at this last Pentecost, and uh, he actually talks about the interrelationship between booths and Pentecost, or weeks and Pentecost, right? Uh, mm, yeah. So I think, do you have the Edersheim book that I'm talking about? Do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, what's the title of it? Uh, Alfred Edersheim, he has two famous books, one on uh, Christ and, and uh, the law, and then one on the temple and its ceremonies. Uh, so he actually has a really good chapter on this question. Um, nice. I'll have to check that out. I've got it here somewhere. Let me see if I can find it. Anybody got another question? of what prophets are and the closing of the office what do you make of uh, Acts 11 27 28 which talks about a bunch of prophets who came to Jerusalem and one of them called Agabus yeah this is the tra- uh, this is the tra- famine. right this is the transition period so between the time of the apostles and the book of Acts that's the founding of the church there is the office of prophet but you'll notice when the apostles die when the early church is set up, um, Justin Martyr, Ignatius, Irenaeus, Cyprian, Tertullian. Nobody talks about prophets anymore, oh, except for Tertullian, because he fell into the heresy of Montanus and became a Montanist. And the Montanists did believe in the continuation of prophets, namely that their own uh, heresy arc, Montanus, was the voice of the Holy Spirit himself. In fact, Montanus said he was the incarnation of the Holy Spirit. But point being is that we know that the uh, office of prophet does not continue on after the death of John. But yes, it is present in the book of Acts. It's in Paul's epistles too. Paul says there's prophets, teachers, apostles, etc. I mean, the fact that Paul mentions apostles, it, there's no, apostles doesn't continue on. Right. But there are prophets after John the Baptist, but not after the death of, say, John the Revelator. Correct. Or something, something like that. 
Okay. Right, but what I was saying is that when we think of a prophet as like the Old Testament office of a prophet, like Isaiah or Jeremiah, I'm saying Jesus says the law and the prophets were until John. And so that's that's an, the, the, the office of prophet, prophet, priest, and king. That's fulfilled in Christ. We don't need prophets anymore. But prophets in the book of Acts and in Paul's epistles, these are people in, who are teachers in the church. And yes, they do have the ability at times to have clairvoyance. Uh, there's, I think Agabus has an instance of clairvoyance, right? Where he takes that belt. <laughs> so, but, but they're not, uh, that's not an office. That's, con- that's for the founding of the church. Just like speaking in tongues is the gift given there at Pentecost, right? Tongues is not happening uh, up into the times of the church fathers. So this is the Edersheim book that I was talking about. The temple, its ministries and services. And there's a whole chapter on what you were asking about. Uh, yeah. Unleavened bread and Pentecost and Tabernacles. It's chapter 14. And he's a famous Jewish convert to Christianity. I don't know if he was an Anglican or what he, what he became, Presbyterian, something like that. But he is relevant because he was a good scholar who kind of was able to look at, uh, you know, J- Jewish history and tradition and find quite a bit of stuff that backed up, you know. That, no, that was people. Alfred, sorry. Alfred at, at Edersheim? Yeah. Yeah, they're very, okay. they're famous books. They, they're pretty much okay. in every Christian bookstore, so. Right, okay, very, very good. You know, Jane, I've been noticing this huge uptick in uh, Judaizing, you know, across yes, all the... I have vi- seen it, too. Vi- yeah. yeah, it's very strange. Uh, Father Deacon, would you want to take over for a minute? Are you still there? Yeah, I just came in. I had to get somebody to drink. What's going on? Uh, I just got to take a brief break. Uh, we were talking about um, Judaizing um, and, and this tendency. Are you seeing an uptick in Hebrew Israelite yeah. or Judaism or, or Messianic Judaism and, and this kind of stuff? You want to speak to that while yes, I. Yes, sure. <laughs> yeah, 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 and it's sure. Oh, sorry. Uh, what, what's, he, what's your take on? What do you think? The, the rise of that where this well is yeah I've noticed it a lot in dissonant you know like dissonant right spheres um, this the, the same I guess founding myth that you see in all these restorationist groups that you know there was a falling away um, at some point in church history and that um, to re- actually revivify the church we need to return to what was done in the Old Testament and you know, by by the Mosaic Law and all these things. So it's just another, you know, branch of um, restorationism. Rest, but restorationism, yeah, that's yeah. Exactly, they all have but that. then it's like tying like a humanist twist to it. You know, like we need to read and speak the original language and have the original name, our original name of of Jesus. You know, and pronounce it properly and all these things. It's so bizarre. Yeah, that's right. Um, and what's strange too is then, well, I mean the idea that well the apostles and so they want to go prior to to Christ, I guess, but I guess they'd have to start learning um, Greek, Aramaic, uh, but the Hebrew that was being written is is nothing that's available to them, right? It's not modern Hebrew. Yeah. Right. What, are they, what is that? It's like, it's not Paleolithic, but it's like middle. There's different phases of like Hebrew. It's amazing if you actually look at and see how different, but no modern Jew would be able to read anything um, from that. But yeah, it's really, it's almost, um, what's the word I want to use? It's good because this kind of comes up in, yeah, they almost make like the words like talismans or something like that. Like, yeah, the that's a good way of putting it. It's superstitious. Are, like, it's, yeah. it's superstitious, yeah. It's like Roman Catholics who think that the demons uh, fear la- the wor- the language of Latin. Latin. If you just speak in Latin, the demons will melt. <laughs> just superstitious. Latin is yeah, a whole, so, yeah, a whole but language. I think there is. I think, Joseph, you're right. 
there is some type of political connection to that's causing this to oh yeah like if you looked at the the QAnon boomers right like if you if you looked at any like QAnon threat there would be people shilling like you need to observe the Sabbath you know blah yeah. blah blah like it's right. crazy well I wonder if like I just finished in um I mean, it was a couple weeks ago, but when I was teaching this political philosophy, we just finished a section called Messianic Nationalism. Mm. And the Messianic Nationalism was that, I mean, it's really materialistic in some sense, but that through a nation and a people in a very materialistic way, that you would be able to bring in salvation for the world, a new age, right? A new kind of eschaton, like a, a new aeon. Mm. And it would transform the, the quality of existence of man in the polis. And I think that you see this... I think that the certainly the Jews had that kind of understanding as well, too. And I see that this resurfaces throughout history many different times, this kind of messianic nationalism, that the nation... I mean, it's even in the United States in some sense. It's yeah, kind I mean, of like America has it. De- yeah, it has its own destiny. And, yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's something more than just patriotism. It's like a group of people in a nation will transform the existence of all mankind in the world. Yeah, Um, messianic nationalism is a good word. Yeah, that makes sense. So I see a rise in in politics of that kind of thought again, and there could be a link there that draws them back to this kind of archaic kind of notions of ancient Hebrews, uh, messianic nationalism and their kind of theology. And, you know, there's just a general temptation a a lot for people of what I call archaeanism, right? It must be true just because the older it is, right? And so this ends up, uh, Jay and I talked about, this is one of the problem with the uh, non-Chalcedonians. What leads them to the problem is they, they won't allow any kind of development of words to address certain like heretical issues. They'll be like, I'm just sticking with this word. I'll never let the, you know, that ever develop in the kind of way it responds to where you end up getting problems. So I think that might be another element too, that people think that, Oh, if I just go back far enough that. Well, the irony is that everything that all these messianic, types are looking for is in orthodox <laughs> i mean that's the irony here is that all of these feasts and all this stuff they're looking for just go watch lewis's video again that's why i put it in here i mean everything there that they're scrounging around for and trying to find uh is is right here right uh, it's in this video right here so uh, once they you know grasp that and by the way uh, what do, would you expect if the church has its roots in the temple and the synagogue worship, and it goes out to the nations, as all the prophets said it would when the covenant opens up to the nations, when the Messiah comes. That's exactly what happened. Of course, it's going to bear the stamp of both its uh, synagogue temple roots as well as its Byzantine period. Of course, it's going to bear the stamp of that. That's what we would expect, right? And that's what has happened. So it's just silly to expect that that somehow it's going to be this pure, I don't even know what, right? Because, I mean, Judaism itself goes undergoes many periods and many phases. There is no ancient pure Judaism in the sense of what uh, the Messianic Jews are trying to recover or whatever they're trying to do. Like, orthodoxy is Messianic Judaism. That's what I'm trying to say. That's why the Byzantine Empire condemned Hellenism and the schools of Plato. And it did it for biblicism. That's what Mayendorf says. Mayendorf says Byzantium is the is the the victory of the biblical worldview over Jerusalem. I mean, excuse me, over Athens. It's a victory of of uh, Jerusalem over Athens. So uh, let's see. We got another subject here from um, Crypto Currenstein. Fifteen dollars. Uh, I don't have any questions, but God bless. Well, thank you, Crypto Currenstein. 
Much appreciated. Anonymous for $5. Thank you for these streams. I pray and hope that hierarchs and priests come to light soon in our churches who say that we should not venerate the icons. Yeah, that's where it's getting down to the to the nitty gritty, right? Where they're trying to tell people not to venerate icons. Um, who work miracles and are part of the true faith. Exactly. Thank you for defending the icons. Yeah, that's one reason we're doing this is to point out what we're supposed to believe, right? Uh, Just venerate the icons. You'll be blessed. Xander the Great. Are, to, yeah, go ahead. What are they going to do? Kick you out for <laughs> Well, they're starting to have this segregated, like, stabby, non stabby sections. So, yeah. Oh, I saw that. Yeah. Xander the Great, $2. Uh, that makes so much sense. What was his question? Oh, nature in person. Um, in terms of the Trinity, my sister and I are trying to point to Christ. Thank you for answering the questions about one mind in, in the Trinity. Yeah. 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 Um, Try reading Basil's letter 38 uh, because Basil has a, a really good discussion on uh, the on nature and person. And then uh, try uh, watch the video that David just made uh, on not three gods because uh, St. Gregory Nyssa is kind of dealing with that question too in his Trinitarian treatise on how it is that God is one and yet also three uh, and we're not polytheists, right? There's not three gods. So uh, David just made about a 20-minute video on that work by St. Gregory Nyssa. Um, what's next? Is that it for the Super Chats? Uh, anybody else in the Discord have a, a topic they want to discuss? Before I get to this book by St. Theodore. Because we've already gone for two hours. Has it been two hours already? Man, yeah, crazy. almost. An hour and 40. If I could just chime in one last Actually, time. Actually, you know what? This. I may just wait on this and I'll retitle this and do it something else. We'll just continue with the Q&A and then I'll do the okay. St. Theodore book later. And then um, I'll, I'll just retitle this this topic based on what, what we end up talking Let's about. Let's just continue with the Q&A yeah, and all. Uh, that's fine. Q&A and all. <laughs> uh, just, uh, just a real quick um, sure. side piece to this. You know, I, I um, we, were, we were discussing about um, the, the QAnon connection to Judi Judaizing and messianic nationalism and all these things i i really like that term messianic nationalism um thank you father deacon um i i i see with that tied to you know it seems like america itself right like this is the audience that we're mainly working with is american protestants right that and it seems like the, the mind virus of chileism um is so deeply rooted in the American psyche, I guess. It so, is. Yeah, it goes back to the um, city yeah. on a hill, the Puritans, yeah. Right, right. And particularly, like you know, like pre-millennialist, um, you know, this this notion of the millennium coming right. literally a thousand years and, right. and, and forgetting, forgetting that as the church age, I feel like that is like probably the main block that, that I see that Protestants need to be destroyed um it, it could you could you touch on that um on how the 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 church is um, you're, you're saying the the the, you're saying the, the belief you're saying the belief needs to be destroyed not <laughs> that all protestants need to be destroyed oh yeah yeah sorry sorry, sorry no, i'm yeah, just joking yeah. it sounded funny yeah. it sounded like like protestants need to be destroyed <laughs> Stamp them out. yeah so i i did a i, I did a talk uh for what one month ago uh two months february 24th i did uh, Protestantism, Catholicism, and dispensationalism. So, if you're interested in that topic, it, it's the last third where I deconstructed dispensationalism and premillennialism. Uh, there's the link to that video uh, if you guys want to go watch that. But um, yeah, I think you're right that it's sort of just in, ingrained in the the mindset of American Christianity of this kind of millennialism, this killism, this uh, uh, immanentization of the eschaton that. That the nations, because because Protestantism doesn't have a church, right? So they've they've lost the historic continuity with that supernatural entity that is the church. The church is not a human social organization. It's not fractured into a million different sects. It's one historic group with absolute succession with the true faith with the sacraments, right? And if you don't have that, then you don't have the church. So. That is the church, and since Protestantism has lost that, it's just got kind of like these pieces of the puzzle. It's got the Bible, right? But they don't have anything else. 
Now they might get some things right, right? They'll get the Trinity maybe correct in a little bit of a way or the, uh, you know, deity of Christ or whatever, or, you know, these kinds of basic generic ideas, they might get that stuff right. But, um, they will then tend because the actual origins of Protestantism historically are actually state churches. Uh, when Luther got his reformation going, it was with the aid of the German princes, Calvin, right? Uh, he turned to the basically a theocracy in Geneva. Uh, the other churches, the Protestant state churches, the Anglican church is a state church, Henry the eighth, right? Uh, the very origins of Protestantism turned the nation state into kind of a version of the church. And so the, it's no accident that the, the Puritans in America, uh, uh, they're sitting on a hill doctrine and all this kind of stuff. It turns America into the new mystical body of Christ, the mystical church. Uh, and that's why they will treat the, the Constitution like it's this inspired revelation of God, right? Uh, and, that, and then that's because they're looking for these things that they lost when they lost the church. So anyway. Wonderfully put. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Uh-huh. Anybody else? We still got, we'll, we'll go for another 20 minutes or so until we get to two hours. <laughs> They have a question. Sure. So uh, I have a friend that I talk with from time to time, and he's a non-denominational Christian. And um, so when I, you know, we debate or whatever to go back and forth, and he says stuff like, uh, "Well, the Bible predates all of these, uh, all of these early Christians that." Uh, that interpret the Bible their way, and he'll say something like, well, even if you're right, um, what does it matter? What does it matter if you have 70 whatever books and we only have 66? What do those extra books matter? Um, and he just kind of goes down that route. Well, guess, actually, it's the other way, it's, it's the other way around. Uh, the, the church predates the Bible. I mean, that's, that's totally backwards, first of all. Um, there, there was no Bible collection of, of books before the church. The church was established at Pentecost. It exists historically before the uh, canon of scripture, uh, just basic fact of history. So that was, that's just flat out false. And then again, I would, right. I would come back to the point that, um, well, if he believes that the Bible is the, you know, final rule of faith and, and morals for any Christian that's, in, that's authoritative and infallible, then he needs to be sure that he's got the right one, right? I mean, doesn't right. It, doesn't it matter which well which one? Yeah, yeah, if the number doesn't matter, then why not just like throw Matthew? Like he could just tear Matthew exactly out of the gospel too. Mm -hmm. Like no, you know what he could do? He could do uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, he just makes a, a Jefferson Bible. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great Bible. that's a great analogy to bring up. Is that well, why do you have a problem with the Jefferson Bible that removes all the miracles? Right. Or I, I like my example of, I say, uh, guys, I've prayed really hard. Uh, I've asked the Holy Spirit, trust me, it's the Holy Spirit that's leading me. And I've come to the conclusion that only the book of Jude is the New Testament canon. Sorry, guys. I know you probably yeah, won't, but that's, that's it. Hard. That's it. But I trust me, I prayed a lot about it. Uh, and I, I, I'm pretty sure that it's God that's leading me to believe this. So um, yeah. just trust me. So in other words, why, why, who has the right canon? If you've got these different groups, how are you, how are we going to resolve this question? There's, there's no prima facie, like a priori, you know, just, well, you just look at the different books, right? Like I've got here before me right now, here's this Bible. That's an Orthodox Bible. And this is my old Calvinist reform study Bible. They've got way more books in this one than this one. How do I know which one's the right Bible? How are we going to determine this? Just looking at the two books isn't going to tell me. Reading it a bunch isn't necessarily going to tell me. How do we know? Yeah, and so like, so like when we go down this route, we kind of end up going like, well, you know, he'll say something like, well, why do you need to pray to saints? Jesus is sufficient. Why don't you just pray to Jesus? You you really need to read Hebrews. Okay, well then, then why do you ask your friends to pray for you? 
uh, your prayers yeah, yeah. talking so directly you to notice, Jesus are sufficient. And I noticed there's somebody in the chat was the same way too. This is typically somebody who's either evangelical or influenced by it. They fall into the false dichotomy and fallacy. Now, if they were consistent in that, they would do exactly as Jake. Why do I need to talk to anybody? I don't need any family. All I need is Jesus, right? So I don't need to eat. I don't need to, to have any social interactions. But do you see how silly that is? It's not an either or. Yeah, right. right. Exactly. That we all work. We intercede for. We pray for one another. Uh, uh, both and ask for each other's prayers, both in this life and those who uh, yeah gone to the next life. Right. And then he'll say something. You know, I'll say, well. You know, the Bible says the prayers of the righteous man. Mm-hmm. And I shouldn't get into it. Like, tell, him, tell him to read the book of Amos because uh, Amos, the whole book of Amos is about Amos praying and interceding and, quote, changing God's mind. Now, Amos didn't really well, change God's one. mind, but the prayers of a righteous man are efficacious. They actually, God wanted to demonstrate that he has chosen to include the prayers of his people in his governance of the universe. And so... Our God, and it's part of our incarnational theology too. Right, that the energies of God work with His people, and we work with the energies of God. It's never an either or. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so you know that He'll always, or I guess it's not just Him, but He'll always say something like, uh, uh, "All, what is that? It's like all, uh, no man is good, no not one, or something like that." Well, that's just a hermeneutical mistake because. Uh, I mean, okay. Jesus is not, that's what we, we covered in the first 15, 20 minutes is hyperbole, right? Um, gotcha. Like call no man father. Yeah. Or uh, cut your hand off if it makes you sin. Well, your hand doesn't make you sin. Okay. It's hyperbole. Uh, no, <laughs> no one is good but God. Well, I mean, he's talking about the father. Does that mean the Holy Spirit's not good? I mean, does that mean that, uh, you know. It says, for example, uh, in Luke 1, that uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous, keeping all the commands of the Lord. Well, they were good. <laughs> they were good people, right? Um, I would ask your friend this. I would say, uh, what do you think is the pillar and ground of truth? And I like to ask that question because when I was a Protestant, right, people would bring that up and I'd say, well, the Bible, right? The Bible's the word of God. The Bible's a p- pillar and ground. The Bible's a pillar and ground of truth. And I would always just say, and, and I remember when somebody asked me this, I said, they would say, well, how come Paul says the church is the pillar and ground of truth? Why doesn't Paul say that the written texts are? And if you read 1 Timothy 3.15, that's what Paul says, right? Uh, know how to conduct yourself, right, in, the, in the, the church of God, which is the pillar and ground of truth. The living body of the community is the pillar and ground of truth, not the written text. The written text, yeah, and then, the written texts are the sorry. liturgical documents of that pillar and ground of truth living body of the church so in other words protestants just take this book out of the context what's the context the liturgy of the church right and, and then it, uh, it, you know it, 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 uh, sorry go ahead no i was just gonna say um and you know where they're gonna go after that they'll say well oh, yeah the church. they'll say what you know they'll just say like uh yeah the church if they go this route, they'll say, yeah, the church is just, you know, the invisible church. Uh, all the people that believe uh, uh, so, in Jesus. No, wait, 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 wait. Uh, Paul says that the church is as visible as Jesus' body is visible. Uh, there is no invisible church. That's a made-up Protestant doctrine. That's a Nestorian doctrine of ecclesiology. And I would say, where's your church in the 3rd century? Where's your church in the 4th century? 5th century? 6th, 7th, 8th, ninth, 10th? Tell them to tell me where is the true believing church in each of those centuries. And then I'll believe your church. And they won't be able to do it because nobody believed anything Protestant in those centuries. Except for stupid heresies. Yep. Okay, thank you. Sure. It just kind of reveals that people think that they... Oh, I can figure out what the teachings are by just picking up a book. And it illustrates uh, the myth of... Uh, neutrality, right? Yeah. Yeah, the text just means what it says and it says what it means. I'll just apply my critical hermeneutic and I'll just just figure it out. But the problem is people aren't figuring it out. 
they're going all over the place. You have to have the right paradigm in order to read the text. So, you, I mean, it's, it should be patently obvious that when people are coming up with these interpretations, it's obviously they, they don't understand what these, they don't know how to read the text. And it's not like reading another book. I mean, I guess there's even some analogies too with other texts. Like if you don't have the right paradigm, you're even going to read, you know, like non-sacred texts. Well, I can remember when I was a Protestant thinking when I would be challenged with these kinds of questions initially. And I remember thinking, well, I mean, I'm sure there's something akin to, to basic Protestant ideas in the first eight centuries of the church. I mean, I, I just assumed, well, I mean, there's got to be something like that. And there's not. So, rude awakening. Yeah, that's, that's, I mean, that's kind of what, uh, what brought me out of Protestantism was right. all the, uh, not all Protestants, but the Protestants I was around, they're, you know, kind of touted St. Augustine. And so yeah, but I then, and, and I, used to, I used to too, and then I realized that he was a bishop, and he believed in apostolic succession, and he believed in yes. relics and the Eucharist and all this kind of, and I was like, oh, okay, so he doesn't actually support my position. Right, yeah, and that's, that's kind of where I began, and then I ran the Antonicene Fathers, and right. uh, all of them, I think, to the man, talks about the Eucharist. And, yep and bishops and stuff like that. And yeah. that's really where I started doubting Protestant. Yeah, I mean, the canons of Nicaea, right? I mean, Nicaea show, the canons of Nicaea show that, like, I thought I was believing, you know, Nicene Christianity as a Protestant. And I remember when I got my Philip Schaff set, I read the, the canons of Nicaea, and it's talking about bishops, it's talking about Eucharist, it's talking about, uh, you know, chrismation, it's talking about fasting, it's talking about all this stuff that, you know, is totally antithetical to Protestantism. And in fact, as a Calvinist, as a Reformed Protestant, I thought was uh, heretical. So I'm like, now, wait a minute. How am I going to call these people heretical? And yet, I'll, well, but I believe their, their creed about Jesus, right? And the eternal generation of the Son from the Father, right? And he's equally divine, homoousius, blah, 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 blah. But I had no, I'd never, and by the way, my pastor, he didn't know what the canons of Nicaea said. He didn't, they'd never heard this stuff. Uh, and then they just double down and the, well, okay, well, I don't have a problem saying that uh, they're all in error and heresy. That was the, they doubled down. I was like, no, I'm not going to, I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. Right. So, okay. Well if, they're, well, if they're all heretical, then where's the church? Well, the church has, er the church has errors and it's got spots and it's been divided and, and, and fallen into mistakes in every century. No, that doesn't work because the gates of hell won't prevail against the church. You can't have the whole body of the church apostate. That's just stupid. That's why all these Protestants that are consistent, they end up in like Joseph Smith positions. Well, it's time to restore the church. Yeah, there was a blackout. Paul Washer, the famous internet Calvinist preacher, he says there was a blackout from the time of the death of the apostles until, I don't know, Anabaptists, whatever he thinks, there's a blackout. Yeah. Well, that's what my friend, I mean, he goes to church or whatever, but like he doesn't even believe everything they, at his church because he has his own. His type of thing. Well, ninety nine percent of the time with pro, not every time, but I mean, there's a few exceptions where it's just people that are bad willed and double down, like James White or somebody like that. But ninety nine percent of the time, it's uh, people are ignorant. So, yeah, he has a he got his master's in the, uh, something I can't remember. He has he's a, a master's. He's a preacher. He has a master's? And yeah. In what? <laughs> I don't remember where he went, but, you know, he got his master's at some Bible college. Like non-denominational um, or Baptist or what? I think it was uh, Baptist. I had to ask him. Okay. You know, well, what? yeah. I mean, it is possible to get your master's as a Baptist and be completely ignorant of church history. That I've seen many people right. like that. So Anyway. Uh, one last thing, uh, kind of regarding this. Have you? Uh, are you aware of a person named? I've Bogey got something Bono? to say to you, brother. I've got something <laughs> to say to you, and you're not going to like it. But I've seen into hell, friends, and I've seen into hell. And when I looked into hell, I saw you there, and I wept over you, friend, because I don't want you to go to hell.
I want you to be saved, but I also believe in predestination and election. And by the way, I'm a missionary who works for NGOs. And please give me money, friend, because I'm going to cry at every point, every time I do this sermon. At exactly 39 minutes and 42 seconds, I'm going to cry because I'm Paul Washer. And I have a fake affected New England almost English accent, friends. Sorry, I, I couldn't resist. Somebody was requesting a Paul Washer impression in the chat, so I did it. Hilarious. Do you know who Bodie Bauckham is? <laughs> no. Who's that? Okay. Who's he? Uh, well, he's uh, he's another uh, guy that influenced my friend a lot. Bodie Bauckham? Uh, that's, his real, that's a real Vody name. Bodie Bauckham. Is that yeah. a real name? It's like, a real name. It sounds like a, uh, like a surfer or something. Yeah. Bodie Bauckham. Hey, like Bodie, dude. Right now. Yeah, it's like the Patrick <laughs> Swayze in Point Break, Bodie. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he's a big black dude. Okay. Anyway, well, he must be right. If he's a big black dude, then I know he's right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but yeah, he, he, the reason I ask is because uh, my friend is in. Anyway, thanks for uh, taking my question. So your, your friend's into Bodieism. Bodieism. Bodhisattva? <laughs> Question J, and I'm totally not a YouTuber guy. Uh -oh. I'm just a random user. We got, um, we got, uh, we got Delvin the Red Med White. Delvin, is that oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Delvin, Delvin <laughs> oh, yeah. the Med White. Just to total, total random. Um, this is a, this is gonna be a very stupid question, but I love stupid questions, so I'm gonna ask it anyway. Okay. Um, would you agree with the assessment that we can? have knowledge only only in three ways i'm not talking about like justify but for example i'm talking about three different ways of knowledge whether we can have them through sense data you know seeing things whether we can know things by contemplation for example let's say we are contemplating logic well it has real existence we know logic exists we can have knowledge through that or we can have knowledge through knowing something's essence would you Agree, those are the only three ways to know something, or would you say that there yeah. can be more ways? More ways. Like, uh, I would what? say for knowing the created order as creatures, I can't think of another way. And then for the Christian, there's the direct perception of the Logi, which is a higher way for those who achieve yeah. theosis. Yeah, I'm I'm asking in the Christian sense pretty much. Like not in the secular sense, but like if you're a Christian I guess I guess knowing the essence will kind of that will answer the question more in details, like perceiving so, the, the yeah. look evil be well, more more accurate, right? I would Which then kind I see of what ties you're into so, contemplation right. a little bit. So I would say that uh when we perceive objects I don't think that um, Aristotle is or John Damascus are wrong to say that we perceive an object and then we, we do abstract. The mind has the power, the ability to abstract principles and, and things from objects. Uh, yes. And that is in contemplation. Yes, perception and sensing wouldn't be a knowing. It would be like a pathway to knowing. Right. Uh, and I think that ultimately what gives unity and coherence and meaning to what we perceive is the logi, even though we may not directly yes. perceive the logi. Ultimately that's where it's grounded as the mind of God. Uh, but even, even an unbeliever can have correct factual knowledge about things and can yes. make true statements because um, even though their noose is dark and they're still able to do contemplation and still able to get part of the picture, right? Mm -hmm. So to speak. So the reason why I'm kind of asking this is, and we had a chat on this a couple of days ago on this voice chat as well. On, I'm kind of thinking, do, does any other religion kind of, you know, how do they even answer the question of the knowledge of God? I mean, for example, let's use the example of Roman Catholics. I think that will be an easy example. How can we even come to know God? If in in that sense, I mean, we will answer. Well, we can contemplate his energies, and they have actual existence, so we can know about God that way. But you can't really answer that question if you're Roman Catholic or even a Protestant, and really, even if you're Nestorian or non-Chalcedonian. To be honest, 
and you can extend this to other religions. So my kind of train of thought is like, are there any religions that kind of answer, try to answer this question or what do they even answer this question with? Because I feel like this is kind of a, no, I think a, the, a, right, a, a but, question that is not tackled enough by like these people, I think. Right. So you can take the critique of absolute divine simplicity and apply it to epistemology. And, and in the Roman Catholic system, their doctrine of knowledge is analogia entis. Uh, the, the Protestant system, their epistemology will be analogia fide. So they'll say analogy of faith. And ultimately their principle of epistemology is the Bible revelation. They'll say that really the only thing that we have certitude about is the Bible. They're inconsistent because they actually believe that the effects of sin, if they're a Calvinist, for example, the noetic effects of sin are such that even after yeah. you're regenerated, you can't interpret the scriptures right. So they don't, they don't even get to God either. And even if they did believe yeah. you could have the, the direct knowledge of God, it's still created grace for the Protestant. Uh, Roman yeah, Catholic has much. the same problem because it's just created effects. That's all. Their, their analogia enthis is still just created effects. So it doesn't actually work as a principle of epistemology. Although Aquinas tries to answer this. Uh, I just read this in Whipple uh, by, and I, I was right because I've said this all along, but uh, just another Thomas scholar who backs this up in an entire chapter uh, they believe that you, that they can ground even natural knowledge in uh, the divine ideas. So uh, the closest that any of these people can come is a kind of divine conceptualism where they're grounding uh, either the essences of creatures or the ideas of things in God, which we agree with that. That's Maximus's Logi doctrine is doing that. But they put them in the essence of God. Yeah. across the board so and you don't know the essence of god so it does nothing it doesn't help you to have a form of divine conceptualism for your epistemology that that locates the ideas and the thing that you can't I mean, know yeah. it's so dumb if how can i mean you have you're going to have divine conceptualism for example you're going to have conceptions about god well they kind of have to be actual and real as well they can't just be kind of like creations of the mind or even an analysis of something created because how can you at all even like get to something created to uncreated verse right but it's not I think in our right. system we can contemplate i mean this is why it connects to prayer hesychasm as well and i think i'm pretty sure saint gregory palamas starts by saying you know like his defense on this essential distinction is defending hesychasm and i think that's kind of yeah connects to that is that like it's part of the contemplation of god and what we're contemplating, we're not contemplating created, you know, substances or effects or something, but rather actual, you know, same maxims with the things around God. Yeah. And like, how, what I'm getting at is that, and yeah, you answered the question in regards to, yeah, like this is, that's how they try to answer. But it seems to me the center of the problem, there's no bridge between the created and the uncreated right. for like any other religious system. Does there's it not. seem like? No, there's not. That's one of the problems of ADS is the epistemology. You can do an, uh, a, an epistemological critique of any simplicity, religion, or doctrine. Yeah. Uh, and in a way, yeah, yeah. I think, I mean, if you think about the body and soul analogy, because the soul is immaterial and the faculties fit, like the mind are immaterial, I think one, couldn't one argue that that's already kind of like a, a mini bridge in that sense, I think you used the term, what was it? The mind is an icon of God's mind, the human mind. Was Did you say something like that? I think in your previous videos, or I remember something like yeah, that. Yeah, it is. But, That's, yeah, the, the fathers speak that way. Yeah, so I mean, will that icon be the mind's immateriality? Well, the mind as a attribute or faculty is immaterial. Yes. Uh, and I'm getting lost here. So, uh, the, so the fact that we have a mind that's immaterial and the relationship between body and soul, are you trying yes. to, are you trying to make an analogy to the I'm way try, that, I'm God, that God that, interacts like, with the world because he's immaterial? Is that what you're saying? I'm basically trying to say like, just how, just like how something immaterial, the soul and the body can unite. Right, any material, any material thing, 
Is it can can that also be an analogy of kind of how God can interact with the material world while yes. being immaterial? Yes. yes, because the model is the same for the interpenetration and yet distinction in body and soul that's applied to the interpenetration of the two energies in Christ because of the two natures interpenetrating mm -hmm. and yet retaining their natural properties. And that's the mo that's also the model for how God relates to the world. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's why that's Maximus kinda, yeah. can say that the, the whole creation is a kind of garment that the Logos wears. He speaks yeah, of the, the three embodiments of the Logos. Mm -hmm. So I guess, I mean, it's like a half question, half thing, like, about, like, even outside of Christianity, like, for example, like, Islam, like, do you know, or anyone else maybe, like, know, like, how they will try to answer this question? Because it seems like there really is no answer in their system is that I'm looking into no, it and I, I don't every, really see Every anything. Muslim that I've debated and apologist that I bring this issue up with doesn't answer it because of their boxed-in doctrine of God, their radical dissimilarity of creatures to God. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't allow for there to be a bridge. Yeah. And final question is what I'm, like, kind of the apex point of what I'm getting at. Will the argument that your religion is kind of atheistic because you cannot account for knowledge of God because you cannot account for contemplation of the uncreated. Can this argument apply to any religion except for orthodoxy, basically? Like, can you kind of use this as a tag argument? Maybe you have used it and I just didn't, like, don't remember, but like... No, I've brought it up before as, yeah, you can use this. In fact, I have a critique of Thomas Epistemology where I critique this very point from about eight years ago. Uh, yeah, I think you can use, you can you can do a type of tag this way where you're saying that if you don't have the right distinctions between nature, will, energy, logi, et cetera, uh, you don't have a way to actually ground uh, epistemology. Um, so for example, uh, William Lane Craig believes in a form of divine conceptualism. So he thinks that objects in the world, the way that we know them is because they're grounded ultimately in God. Now, we would agree with that, but what do you mean by grounded in God and how does that actually work? Well, he doesn't have a Logi doctrine. So he thinks the essences of creatures are the ideas or the, 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 he would say what's the idea is the essence of a creature and it is the essence of God or it's in the mind of God, right? And we're not identifying the Logi or the idea with the essence of a creature. Creatures have their own creaturely essence in creatures that are patterned on Logi. So in other words, they collapse the uh, creaturely essence into the essence of God. And that's why that doesn't work. So you can't have a co you can't have divine conceptualism as a form of epistemology without the Logi doctrine. That's what I'm trying to say. Does, yeah. that, does that make sense or is that confusing? That absolutely makes sense. Yeah. That's, That's why I've been trying to apply. Kind of I've been trying to apply Maximus to apologetics. Mm -hmm. uh, and like as a final note to the viewers and and all that is that I think it's very interesting. I will definitely recommend them checking out the Cappadocians debate against Eunomius because actually a lot of this is kind of repeated there. Yeah. And a big part of the debate that is like I've I have not seen academics talk about this at all. Like they talk about all sorts of boring nonsense but they don't talk about this is about knowledge of god i mean that's a big theme in their debate like you know because that's why you know me says we know god's essence one well, class like why will he say something so stupid well it's because for him there's no other way because he has to reject distinction right and the point is that really you know me says um let's say you know me says response is what the response of the other world religions in general, right. as I will say. Islam, Arceism, Protestants, the non calcedonians uh, and, all, and Buddhists, Hindus, and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, thanks for answering my questions. I definitely... Uh, yeah, this relates back to the point that I always make about Thomism that was... Uh, well, I can't find my Thomas notes, but... Uh, you can't say uh, we we only know what God is, or, or we don't know what uh, what God is, but we know that He is, and then turn around and say, and we know what we know what He is. It doesn't work. Yeah.
Here it is. Here's my notes. What would that even refer to? If it refers to the essence, then like, t congratulations, you are Unomian. Yeah, we know that God is, not what he is. Okay, these are the first two points of Thomism. But Thomas and the Thomists also say God's essence is identical to his existence. We yeah. know his existence. His essence is identical to his existence. We don't know his essence. Then you don't know his existence <laughs> because you just equated them. So. Yeah, pretty much. Or either that the only really good answer you can give, which is not a good answer, but the only consistent one is probably you will say that, that existence we know of is a created thing, which gets yeah, but to the same but, dilemma. But, but then you don't know God's existence. Then you, so right. you know a created version. Right. Aquinas tries to get around this. And Jay and I talked about this in Summa Theologica Question 2, Article 1, remember? Uh, but we were able to find problems with... Yeah, and I, so the Whipple, the Whipple chapter is on this, and it's about uh, participation. So for Aquinas... Sorry, the, article 2, forgive me. Question 2, Article 2. So on the, on the chapter on the one and the many in Aquinas and Whipple, uh, it's about how is there participation in God on the part of creatures. And if you ever talk to Thomas, they'll try to you know persuade you, oh, bro, we're just saying the same thing. We're all on the same team. Uh, look, you uh, Orthodox believe in participation, so do we. And then when Aquinas goes to explain what it is, it's participation by likeness, not actual metaphysical participation. You, you, that can't happen, right? Creatures don't metaphysically participate in God in the sense of partaking of God. They partake of God by likeness, by similarity, similitude, analogia. And the other, the other explanation is by the fact that the divine ideas that are the patterns of creatures are patterned on the divine essence. But there's not a metaphysical participation in God himself. It's participation by likeness. So it's not really participation. That's the point. And by the way, Aquinas does not believe uh, that universals have a real existence. Do that again. <laughs> uh, by the way, uh, Thomas Aquinas he doesn't believe in uh, universals have a real existence. Uh, you believe this, folks? Can you believe this, folks? Uh, folks, can you believe this? Okie doke. Yeah. So anyway, I mean, here's like you know, top Thomas saying everything I've said for. What if we uh, just did all our like apologetics and like uh, past precedents? Aquinas tear down this wall. <laughs> <laughs> you can have peace right now Thomas tear down this wall and I forgot by the way that you can read this I, I read the Cambridge Companion to Aquinas years ago it's got Norman Kretzmann in it I mean it's it's this is not a this has recognized it has Eleanor Stump it has Norman Kretzmann and there's a whole chapter on Aquinas' epistemology which David you would find that interesting because it goes into some of what you're talking about uh, Aquinas' theory of knowledge uh, Aristotle Aquinas, uh, Aquinas' Metaphysics by Whipple that I just pointed out. Um, and yes, these these points are brought up. I mean, the essay that I wrote uh, several years ago, I just realized that if Thomas believes that natural knowledge is also based on the divine ideas, then you can't... You, 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 then this is going to be in conflict with his distinction between nat uh, natural and supernatural knowledge. Because it's bo both are grounded in the divine ideas. But the divine ideas are the divine essence. There's no similarity between the divine essence and creatures because they're fundamentally one. If the distinctions in the divine essence are not real distinctions, then creatures based on those patterns are not really distinct. We're all just one, bro. So it doesn't work as a, as a way to ground epistemology is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. If you collapse the divine ideas into the divine essence, then this is not going to function as a way to have distinctions in the world. It's not going to work for the one, the many problem because the essence of God is not really distinct. Creatures are really distinct from one another. I'm not you, right? We're actually different. But if we're based on the essence of God and there's no real distinctions in the essence of God, then how is there real distinctions in the creatures? 
There's not multiple creatures have multiplicity. The essence of God does not have multiplicity. And they'll always come back with, well, but it's a distinction in terms of the multitude of the effects. No, we're not talking about cause and effect. I know what he says about that. We're talking about the ideas, the doctrine of divine ideas that are identical to the divine essence. There's an idea of me. There's an idea of you. There's an idea of every creature that's the grounding of the creatures that's in the essence of God. It doesn't work. And Thomas doesn't just ground supernatural knowledge in the divine ideas. Natural knowledge itself is grounded in the divine ideas. That's how crazy this is. But now, wait a minute. We don't have any direct perception in this life of the essence of God. Yeah, exactly. So how do you actually know that the creatures are based on the divine essence? It doesn't work because you've cut the human mind off from God. You only know created effects. So you never get back to the divine essence. That's why this doesn't work. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Actually, no. It makes no sense. Of course it makes sense. <laughs> we just say that, yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, talk you said for the last two and a half hours doesn't make any sense, but I'm just kind of playing along. Well, Emmanuel, yeah. for, well, Emmanuel for $10 says, I'm afraid by supporting the stream that I will not catch up to the videos. By the way, I put a link to David's channel in the chat. You can follow uh, David the Mil Real Mad White as well. Thanks, bro. Uh, Tom Green for $3. Since life thrives on death, uh, if a cow eats grass and then a cow dies and feeds the soil for the grass, how would this work in the eschaton? Well, there's no death in the eschaton, right? So the whole of creation is is operating under a differing, different operating system, right? Than it would be in Eden or in the eschaton. So that'll all be done away with. Is it something we have no idea about? Well, we have a general idea about it from Eden and from what we're told about the resurrection, right? So we know it'll be physical. We know we'll still have bodies. There'll still be people. There'll still be trees you know the world universe etc but there won't be death so how exactly all that works i don't know tom green three dollars jay do you reckon that you could do a stream on soul after death by father seraphim rose uh yeah i just haven't got around to it because it's such a controversial sort of annoying topic not the doctrine itself is not annoying but the way people get, get all tripped up on it's annoying to me but uh, i think david didn't you just do a toll house video by the way Yes, I, I've done a video on that issue. It is based on that book. Um, you can go check that out for yeah, the time being. There's David's channel. Go, go watch David's video. Yeah, on. Dave, you, that was like one of your most recent ones you just yeah. said, right? Mm -hmm. so All right. That, that, doesn't, that doesn't cover the entire book, It just, but it does get a lot of quotes and right. patristic citations from that book. But like, there's a lot of things that the book covers about, for example, secular afterlife experiences and how it relates to orthodoxy okay. that I didn't really cover. So, oh, I mean, if, okay. Jay, so if you plan on, I mean, I'm definitely down to like join it because I've yeah, I just have to get around to it. Yeah. Down the road, we'll get to that eventually, Lord willing. But all right, uh, I'm getting tired, but everybody, thank you. I'm, I'm tired too. I'm yeah, sorry. This. Uh, bless you guys. I'm sorry the stream was uh, mistitled. We didn't actually talk about the book. I'll talk about that book some other time and rename the streams. Uh, be sure and follow Father Deacon, uh, follow Snack, uh, follow uh, David, oh, David. Uh, Real Med White, uh, follow everybody in our 